My recent feature-length documentary, Here Comes a New Challenger, exploring the history of the arcade smash hit and home console favourite from the 1990s, Street Fighter 2, is now available as a digital version to stream and download. Also available to purchase is the region-free Blu-ray, produced in limited numbers with added special features. For more information, check out the links below. Three billion human lives ended on August 29th, 1997. The survivors of the nuclear fire called the war Judgment Day. They lived only to face a new nightmare, the war against the machines. The resistance was able to send a lone warrior, a protector for John. It was just a question of which one of them would reach him first. Get down. <laughs> Now, don't take this the wrong way, but you are a Terminator, right? Yes. Sabathan Systems Model 101. You're not here to kill me. My mission is to protect you. I'm gonna go get my mom, and I order you to help me. Come with me if you want to live. The main most directly responsible is Miles Bennett Dyson. He's the director of special projects at Cyberdan Systems Corporation. It must be destroyed. We got Skynet by the balls now, don't we? Got to go now. John! Go! Now! Hasta la vista, baby. The summer of 1991, Terminator 2 was the most anticipated film of the year. The first film had built up a big fan base since 1984, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was a superstar by this point, and this sequel was the most expensive film ever made, costing in the region of $100 million. Once it hit cinemas, it became the biggest hit that year, earning over $500 million worldwide. With the success of Batman in 1989 thanks to its marketing muscle, TT would follow a similar path to capture the interests of kids and teenagers, with merchandise including action figures and, of course, video games. By 1991, video games based on movies were very common, and T2 was the hottest property so games were produced on every gaming platform, with appearances on home computers, handheld devices, consoles and even a pinball machine. The pinball version would be the first to arrive on the scene, produced by Williams Bally Midway, who had acquired the rights from Corolco to produce a pinball and an arcade machine. The pinball version arrived in late June of 1991. Pinball machines had seen a resurgence during this time, and the machine saw an upgrade over the traditional displays you'd find on those machines. This featured a video mode via the dot matrix display called a DMD. Terminator 2 Judgment Day is the first game to feature an auto plunger, as well as a ball firing cannon dubbed Gun Grip Ball Launcher. Arnold Schwarzenegger provided his voice for the game, saying things like Get a super jackpot. Fire at will. Arnold featured heavily on the artwork, however the T-1000 does not feature, with the exception of a small image of the actor Robert Patrick, because of the secrecy surrounding who the villain of the film was. The character is only in the display animation, because when the DMD programming was finalised, the liquid metal character was already public knowledge. The pinball machine was a huge success and remained in the charts for over a year, and it can still be found at retro gaming events and dedicated retro arcades. Though the pinball version was never ported to computers and consoles, it would be made available digitally to play via the pinball arcade years later, but the license expired in 2018. In November of 1991, Replay Magazine interviewed the developers of the T2 arcade machine. Back in 1990, Midway executive Neil Castro asked game designer George Petro if he would be interested in producing a game based on next year's summer movie, Terminator 2. George was super excited and he and his colleagues were flown out to LA to read the script, as at the time James Cameron didn't want to let the script out of his sight. They were so impressed with the story and felt there would be no problem coming up with a video game. The creative team at Midway had the challenge of what type of game it would be. They went in a number of directions but they settled on a gun game. They felt the market for that genre had become a bit stale and this would be a staple into that category. After a few meetings with Cameron he had gotten to know the team and their plans for the game and he was familiar with their successful track record. James Cameron told his staff to give these people what they need to help Midway bring their vision to life. 
James Cameron, however, was a bit concerned with a gun-style game, as he wanted to be responsible, and said, I don't want the video game players to use their guns to really kill anybody in the game. So to solve this problem, they mirrored the movie's storyline of where the Terminator swears he wouldn't kill anyone, and you can only wound them. Midway became almost part of the production. Each week, videotapes of footage were sent from Hollywood to Chicago, and the team got to visit the set so they could film their own material. They had access to the very expensive miniatures and props used in the film, they even had access to the actors, such as Robert Patrick and Edward Furlong. For Linda Hamilton and Arnold, they made use of their stunt doubles, but Arnold did provide his voice to the game, recording a script prepared by sound artist Chris Granner. The material Midway recorded would then be digitised frame by frame into the computer using software called Multiplanner. This software allowed the developers to create 16 different layers of backgrounds, which you can populate with 16 different layers of approximately sized characters and props resulting in a 32-layered picture. The computer adjusts the scrolling speed, object lighting and shading, bringing a strong depth of realism never seen in a game before. As it was a two-player game, they had to create a multi-tracking soundboard, which can play seven simultaneous channels, which four can be used for speech and sound effects, so each player could hear the sound of their own gun firing. The game consists of seven stages, with the first four set during the Future War, which only appears at the start of the film for the intro and the last three levels are set in the 1990s. At Cyberdyne, the escape in a SWAT van being chased by the helicopter and lorry containing liquid nitrogen, and finally at the factory where the T-1000 meets his demise. In the USA, the game topped the charts for the upright arcade cabinets in December 1991, and remained at the top until April the following year, briefly knocking Street Fighter II off the top of the charts, but T2 would find itself fall down the list when Street Fighter II Champion Edition arrived on the scene. <laughs> Everyone's favourite lacklustre distributor of video games, LJN, who specialised in toys, had moved into video games in 1987 and were eventually bought by Acclaim in 1990, though the LJN brand name would still be used. They saw Terminator 2 would be a big moneymaker for the home console market. Probe software would be enlisted to port the arcade to the various home gaming platforms and handheld devices. The game would be retitled T2 The Arcade Game to avoid confusion with the upcoming platformer game also being published by LJN. The Game Boy version arrived first, followed by the Mega Drive port in December 1992. Because of Sega's strong interest, it gave them the opportunity to shift the new Menacer light gun and cut a deal with a claim to release the game first on the Mega Drive before the Super Nintendo. The game would be used as part of Sega's marketing campaign. The SNES port would arrive in late 1993. All the ports vary in quality, as the arcade machine was very advanced for the time, so the programmers had to compress a lot of data, shrinking down a 32 megabyte coin up down to an 8 meg cartridge, resulting in smaller sprites, or in some cases they had to redraw them to fit within the hardware limitations. Probe owner Fergus McGovern was interviewed by Video Games and Computer Entertainment in early 1993, and he said the code written for the coin up was an entirely different language to the Genesis slash Mega Drive, so you couldn't just copy everything over. They had the artwork from the coin up and decided what they could and couldn't use. The artists would often just redraw the assets. They ended up creating the game entirely from scratch. The game was written by one programmer, who was Paul Carruthers, who was interviewed in issue 17 of Retro Gamer. He said he programmed it quite badly, saying there were some bugs in the game that really pissed people off. There was a lot of external pressure to finish it, and he only had five months to complete the job. With the 16-bit console war, the Super Nintendo version looked closer to the arcade compared to the Mega Drive and Amiga conversions. The sprites look very similar to the coin-up and the colours used, though it's darker in its overall design and it lacks animation in areas, in particular the T-800s who appear in the foreground. Despite the strong visuals, the music and sound effects were very drab and sound heavily compressed. <laughs> Most of the gaming press were pleased with the arcade ports to the consoles, but some felt some of the magic was lost, having to use a joypad and making use of Sega's Menacer Gun and Nintendo's cumbersome Super Scope, and the difficulty was too high. Level 3 protecting John Connor in his truck was a nightmare in single player. Sega Pro awarded it 94%, praising its gameplay and graphics, but Games Master was less thrilled, awarding it 80%, saying you'll love the blasting and you'll love the Menacer option, but you probably won't love Stage 3 for ages. Joypad play seriously depletes the wide-eyed frenzy that the Menacer offers. Nintendo Magazine System awarded it 78%, pointing out its faithful conversion, but having to use the Super Scope, Joypad or even the mouse didn't have the same impact as the arcade Uzi light gun. Journalist Paul Davis summed it up by saying, In the end, Super NES T2 is reduced to an expensive souvenir of a startling film and a lukewarm rendition of a red-hot coin-up. 
magazine CVG gave the Game Gear version 80%, saying this game is tougher than a two-week old pork chop. But there the similarities end, because it's a lovely game, graphics are top-notch and very close to the arcade, though Sega Power was less impressed giving it 64%, feeling it was a bit tiresome to play. Total Magazine gave the Game Boy port 71%, summing it up by saying it couldn't compete with the arcade on the graphics and sound front, but the frantic action remains intact. Magazine The One gave the Amiga port 84%, saying T2's got everything, superb graphics, loads of sampled sound effects and has been ported well from the coin-up. But Stuart Campbell of Amiga Power gave the Amiga version 57%, saying the graphics are small and shoddy, the sound is largely horrible, gameplay is repetitive and swiftly tedious, and you will more than likely finish it inside of three or four goes, and town should be inferior to the Mega Drive version, and there is little excuse for that. And finally, the PC conversion was given 5 out of 10 by PC Review who had some issues trying to get it to run properly, which was apparently a common issue with the game. But given how old the game was by early 1994 when the PC version arrived, they said frankly it's all a bit boring. Waggling your mouse around isn't a great substitution for hammering your finger on a gun trigger. T2 the arcade game is certainly a lot of fun, but only in short bursts. It gives you that thrilling action you want, but wears thin after a while. With it being an arcade game at heart, and not designed for the comfort of home gaming, it's designed to eat up your spare change so the difficulty becomes tough pretty quickly. Presentation wise you can understand why it appealed to so many people back in 1991. The graphics were very impressive, and with it basically being a souped up version of Operation Wolf, it's hard to ignore its strengths. The SNES port is clearly the winner, and the Sega version taking second place for having the most rocking soundtrack. I played this a lot on the Mega Drive and rarely got that far into it. The difficulty on level 3 was too high and after repeating the same few levels over and over again it begins to lose its appeal. Also what's going on with the gold terminators? It's like short circuit in the sequel. Why is he gold? I feel alive! Ocean Software was well known in Europe for their licensed titles, popular games such as Robocop and Batman under their belt. The company I believe would sub-license it from LJN during the film's post-production in March of 1991, which was reported by CVG magazine. Ocean wouldn't actually produce the game for the micro-home computers, but instead pushed it into the hands of developer Dementia. In August of 1991, CU Amiga magazine interviewed the developers at Dementia, Kevin Bolmer and Richard Costello about the production of the game. They revealed they had met with Ocean to seek funding for an RPG game that would be even better than the recently released Eye of the Beholder, which was popular with PC and Amiga users at the time, and they had already produced a well-received game with Corporation. Ocean manager Gary Bracey was impressed with their proposal, but wanted them to develop their recently acquired license, Terminator 2, first. Although Kevin was a Terminator fan, he was initially hesitant to accept the offer, not wanting to work on a licensed title. Bracey gave Bulmer a copy of the T2 script. Bulmer gained an immediate interest in developing a video game. Ocean wanted the game to be completed within six months for its intended August release, with the game intended to arrive on a ZX Spectrum first. Within two weeks of accepting the job, Bulmer submitted 20 sheets of Terminator 2 game designs. One idea was a 3D shoot-em-up from the first-person perspective and an interactive adventure game, but given they had six months development time, those ideas were scrapped. The developers were unfamiliar with Ocean's previous licensed titles, which had followed this similar formula, which broke up the action levels with mini puzzles. Kevin Balmer said he was initially unaware that such a mix had already been used in previous games. Kevin played Robocop 2, Total Recall, as well as Ocean's Batman game, and wasn't impressed and said that they made us more determined to make Terminator 2 a better, more playable series of ideas. Because of the secrecy surrounding the film, Dementia was initially limited to using just a script as a reference for the game, which was common. Many developers complained of the lack of visual references to help them with the art direction on some occasions, and led to them making some mistakes, but thankfully by March of 1991 the trailer was released and gave them a better idea of the tone. As the Amiga and Atari ST could display FMV in a very limited way of course, they took frames from the trailer and digitised them for inclusion in the game to help the story between each stage. Because of the lack of memory on the C64, Spectrum and Amstrad, these would be dropped. The C64 would have some exclusive pixel art, whereas the Spectrum and Amstrad versions just had some simple text. Brad Fidel's score to T2 was not allowed to be used, so the composers Jonathan Dunn and Dean Evans had to produce music that sounded like the Terminator, but wasn't an exact copy. 
so the opening of the game features a theme that evokes the Terminator march and the rest of the game is pretty lacking in music, with some additional bits of music for the puzzle stages and electronic hums that sound like signal noise. Kevin had a hand-painted model of the original Terminator, which he would digitise and put into the game for the opening sequence. It's seen in full on the Amiga, PC and Atari versions, and only shown as a still on a Specky and Amstrad. The C64 would have original artwork produced. As with some games based on films, Ocean was prohibited from using the likeness of the actors from the film. In some cases they could use stills from the movie, but were not allowed to copy publicity stills or film posters, so their game counterparts had to be designed in a way that would only vaguely resemble the actors. The puzzle level moving the blocks to form Arnie's face, there are two versions out there. One has an artist's impression, which is the official release, but if you have a copy featuring a digitised still of Arnie, then you are using an early working progress version that was leaked before the game's release. Shortly before the game came out, it was reported in the One magazine in August that Bomber's house was robbed and among what was stolen was some of his work for Terminator 2. While Ocean luckily had backups of the data, several days work of the game's development was lost. The levels are based on prominent scenes from the film, and most of the games released across the gaming platforms featured variations on this. Each level features one of several gameplay styles, such as a beat-em-up fighting between two Terminators, or vertically scrolling driving sequences as you flee from the T-1000. Sarah's Hospital Escape is played as a side-scrolling level, other levels are played as a sliding puzzle game in which the player must perform repairs on the T-800. Successfully completing these levels will increase the player's health for the next level but winning the puzzle game is not necessary to progress forward. The C64 version would be the most complete with nine levels, featuring three encounters with the T-1000, two puzzles, two driving sections and two platform levels, with Sarah escaping from the hospital and the Terminator escaping from Cyberdyne. All the other versions would drop these platform levels, but the Amiga, Atari ST and MS-DOS ports would include an on-the-rails type shooter, with the Terminator walking down the street shooting the cops. The game was finished on time for the film's UK release, but the game would end up getting pushed back till October to take advantage of Christmas, with the Spectrum and the C64 versions arriving in October, and the Amstrad and 16-bit computer ports would follow in November. At the time, Commodore were trying to promote their recently released cartridge-based console, the C64GS, and this new T2 cartridge was apparently compatible with it, but it wouldn't work because you had to press a key on the keyboard to make it run, but it had no keyboard. Very embarrassing for the company. But Commodore did find success for Christmas of 91 with packing the game with their standard C64. The box had the tagline, I've returned, instead of I'll be back for copyright reasons. It would end up being the third most popular video game with sales during the Christmas season. The game got mixed reviews due to it not being very original with its gameplay, the Spectrum version was awarded 88% by Crash Magazine, however, for its flashy graphics despite claiming it was lacking in gameplay, due to the repetition in the levels, but declared a great conversion of the film. Zap64 awarded the Commodore version 89%, saying a huge and professionally executed movie tie-in, rarely brilliant but always competent and benefiting massively from cartridge ease of play. Amstrad Action also awarded the CPC version with an identical rating of 89%, saying it has its drawbacks, but it certainly keeps you coming back for more and more. They also say Level 2 is so addictive it should only be available on prescription. A very odd comment considering most gamers hated that level. Critics for the Amiga magazines weren't as easily impressed. CU Amiga gave it 69% and called the gameplay styles simplistic and dull. Amiga Power awarded it 65% and called it a typical movie license in just about every sense. It follows the plot closely, gives you a lot of sub games for your money, even provides a few digitised animations, but also wrote, there really isn't much in the way of worthwhile gameplay in here. Atari ST user slammed it and awarded it 35%, calling it yet another great movie turned into a repetitive and dull spin-off. And finally, PC Review gave the game the lowest score of 2 out of 10, complaining it was a straight-up port of the Amiga game and felt the developers should have spent more time on the design and told their readers to save their money. Let's be honest, Terminator 2 on the home computers is a fine example of a lazy licensed game. By this point, Ocean Software's formula for these licensed titles was wearing thin on gamers. And with a lot of these titles, they could be completed in under 15 minutes, and costing close to £20 at this point, it was a big chunk of your pocket money. My experience with the game was on Christmas of 1991, when I got my first computer. I got the Terminator 2 Commodore 64 pack. I think my parents chose that computer based on how expensive the games were for the Mega Drive and Nintendo console. 
and got me the C64, which was clearly running out of steam at this point. So this was the first computer I ever owned, so I'll always have a nostalgic connection to it. And to be honest, I think the C64 game is the best out of the bunch. It provides the most levels, the visuals are impressive for the ageing hardware, and it has a decent chip tune rendition of the theme by Jonathan Dunn, who handled the audio on all the 8-bit conversions. The Amiga, Atari ST and PC versions should be far superior considering the hardware they had available. Sure, the animation is very good in areas, but I think incorporating those FMV clips which looked rubbish, just ate up valuable space on the disc, and could have been dedicated to spicing up the gameplay and adding extra levels to give gamers who had splashed out on the new hardware that they were getting a superior version. Arriving the same time as the arcade release and the games from Ocean Software, though UK gamers had to wait till July of 92, was the Game Boy game, developed by the UK-based company Bit Studios, who had previously worked on Robin Hood Prince of Thieves and a port of Chase HQ. The Game Boy had become their main platform, and they would eventually begin to develop games for the 16-bit consoles with varying degrees of success, and T2 was the first game the company developed entirely in-house. The game takes place across six levels, with the first two focusing on John Connor, who as a kid I thought was Sarah Connor, because the sprite appears to have long hair. John travels through Skynet territory and into their headquarters whereby level 3, which is a puzzle game, oh my god a puzzle game, you have to reprogram a T-800 who was then sent back in time. In the fourth level, John and the T-800 ride a motorcycle and have to evade the T-1000. Level 5, you infiltrate Cyberdyne systems to retrieve technology from the 1984 T-800 and the final level, the players face off against the T-1000 in a steel mill. But you don't end up being lowered into the molten steel, as it just ends with an image of a happy future from what appears to be a deleted scene from the film. Sarah Connor appears in between levels to explain the story. With communication with the film company, the developers were repeatedly told that Sarah Connor's bangs were too small in the game for the cutscenes. Because of regional differences, the development team thought the film company was talking about her breasts, so they kept making them larger, until they realised it was her hair, and with the usual legal issues, Arnold's likeness could not be used in the game. In an interview with Bit Studios by RetroGamer in issue 188, they revealed T2 had been a turning point for the company, and it allowed them to accelerate their growth. Founder of Bit's Fu Katan said the feedback from the press was strong, they praised the graphics and presentation, its varied gameplay and the faithfulness to the movie, and he wasn't wrong. Total Magazine awarded it 80%, saying a predictable film license but no less fun for that. It doesn't shine as a game but as a Terminator 2 conversion, it ain't half bad. Meme Machines went even higher, giving it 90%, saying Terminator 2 is one of the best Game Boy releases in some time. The levels differ enough to give some variety, there's no fault in the graphics either, with loads of great sprites, backgrounds and animation. The Game Boy game I played briefly as a kid and found the first level a bit challenging as I was stupid and didn't realise you had to shoot the power generators in order of height and kind of gave up on it. But playing it years later I managed to get quite far into it and eventually died as you only have one life to get through the entire game. The graphics are very impressive and detailed, especially for a title in the early days of the Game Boy and the music is nicely composed and fits well with the game. Definitely worth a playthrough if you get a chance, far more enjoyable than those Ocean Software titles and even the upcoming 16-bit games. Terminator 2 Judgment Day on the NES would hit store shelves in February of 1992 and for Sega's Master System over a year later in November 93 for the European market and the Game Gear version would arrive in the USA a month later. Developed by Software Creations by a team of three people, programmer Stephen Ruddy, artist Anthony Anderson and the music by Jeff Follin. Though they are not credited in the game, something LJN would do sometimes, for the NES version LJN believed that the players who owned a Nintendo would also be the same people who would own a Game Boy, therefore LJN wanted an entirely different gaming experience. The NES version consists of five levels. The first level is set at a truck stop, where the player must beat up truckers and acquire a motorcycle and a gun. The second level is played from a diagonal overhead perspective as the T-800 flees from the T-1000 on a motorcycle. The player must avoid debris while simultaneously using the gun to shoot at the truck, keeping it back at a safe distance. The player then searches for Sarah Connor at the mental hospital, encountering staff members and the T-1000. The player loses energy if they kill any hospital employees and instead must crouch down and shoot them in the leg, disabling them. The player then travels to Cyberdyne Systems to plant explosives and destroy the facility. The final battle ensues between the two Terminators at the steel mill, of course. The Sega version, for whatever reason, omitted the motorcycle level and a couple of the cutscene graphics were dropped or changed entirely, ending up with a shorter game. 
what you come to expect from the critics for the various T2 games, the reviews were mostly underwhelming. Total Magazine, who also reviewed the Game Boy version in the same issue, were less than impressed and preferred the Game Boy version and awarded the NES game 74%. They said it was a lovely looking game with strong animation and plenty of action, but it all gets very samey with levels 3 and 4 going on for too long. Me Machines magazine gave it 72%, with Richard Ledbetter of Digital Foundry fame saying after the pretty excellent Game Boy version, I was expecting a more in-depth colour version of the same game. I ended up being rather disappointed. Although there are 5 levels, there are only 3 different styles of play, with none of them being that interesting. Reviews for the Master System and Game Gear release were mostly negative, as it arrived too late after the movie and was basically a port of the NES game from the year before. Sega Pro awarded it 35% complaining of flickering graphics with old ideas and poor animation. Sega Power gave the Game Gear release 44% complaining the Terminator moves too quickly and on the later levels you have enemies shooting you off screen before they make their appearance, causing much frustration. I never got a chance to play this game back in the day as the NES didn't have much of a stronghold in the UK due to its poor marketing and the cost of the cartridges and by this point most gamers had gone with the Mega Drive or upgraded their old Speckies or C64 to the Amiga so this NES version didn't get much notice. Upon playing it years later I found the game pretty tough like many of these licensed games expensive to buy and tough to complete as they could be finished in under 20 minutes if mastered. The NES game is the first to offer a level dedicated to the arrival of the Terminator instead of skipping straight to the semi-truck chase. It does make great efforts to tell the story of the film and is nicely presented, has really creative music but it's still an unremarkable platformer due to the strong competition on the console. The gamers who weren't too keen on light gun games and preferred their traditional platformers were probably excited to see Terminator 2 arrive on the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive in the genre they were most familiar with. But unfortunately LJN kept up to their reputation of putting out another subpar game. They passed on coding duties to Bit Studios who had a great track record after having success with the Game Boy version but their move to 16-bit consoles had proved unsuccessful, coding the dreadful Last Action Hero game a year later. In an interview with Steve Howard who had coded the game by YouTuber Dreamcatcher, Steve revealed that LJN wanted a quick game conversion and they weren't too worried about the end results. Steve said a lot of effort went into coding the game and stretching the hardware and video memory, although you wouldn't notice it. By the end the game was rushed and the driving sections were never properly finished, they ran out of time to make it playable. Steve revealed because of the way he had written the code in the game, they managed to convert it to the Mega Drive in about a day. Levels are based on 8 locations from the film, including a truck stop, John Connor's house, a shopping mall, a mental hospital, a weapons cache, the house of Miles Dyson, Cyberdyne systems and the final level, you guessed it, it's at the steel mill. Once defeating the T-1000, you don't get lowered into the molten steel, you just disappear. So bizarre. To help guide you through the game, HUD messages appear on screen to inform you of mission objectives, such as leading John Connor to safety and items that have materialised from the future. To break up the action there are a number of driving sections which lets you control the Terminator on his motorbike using a police car and then driving the SWAT van near the end as you escape from Cyberdyne. These parts of the game are a nightmare. When the game was released reviews were as expected. The majority of the critics hated the game, especially the driving segments, which was a major drawback, though two magazines sung its praise. Mega Action awarded it 89%, saying the game is well thought out and good fun. The music is atmospheric and the digitised pictures portray the movie well. In all, a great conversion. Oh silly Steve. And Electronics Games gave it 86% for the SNES, the Mentalists. Sega Power awarded it 27%, calling the graphics dreadful, lacks excitement throughout and had stodgy controls. Mega Magazine didn't even feel it justified a page to be reviewed and instead mentioned it in their monthly roundup of new titles. They gave the game 22%, stating the graphics are a bit on the dodgy side and the animation on the Terminator when he jumps is laughable. Me Machine Sega awarded it 15% and called the game an outright disaster for acclaim who ought to bin this title before anyone noticed it exists. Paul Davis added, ramming a brick into the brain would provide more pleasure than playing this game. Megatech gave it the lowest score of 12%, writing you'll be hard pressed to find a more inept game than this. It's absolute trash and the claim should be ashamed that they are actually releasing it. 
as you might imagine, the game is objectively a load of old crap, though I do admire their efforts to stick close to the film with the levels, such as locating Dyson, the Terminator arm and chip at Cyberdyne, and even mimicking the Terminator's introduction as he walks naked into the bar, hiding his private parts, which is very amusing. But the ugly graphics, clumsy controls, poor hit detection, the Terminator being too slow and jumping like a fool, makes this iconic legend of cinema look like a total plonker. And good god the music is grating. Surely they could have come up with something to resemble the film's score, and not this repetitive nonsense that was slapped together in 10 minutes. But strangely, the SNES game, which is a bit better than a Sega counterpart, does provide a remix of the Terminator theme that opens the game and is used for the final level, though it's dropped from the Sega port, maybe due to some legal issues, and they had to remove it at the last minute. The driving levels can be made bearable to play by driving down the centre of the road, but for most fans of the film, this is one to avoid. Excellent. And last, we have a chess game based on Terminator 2 called Chess Wars, developed by Intracorp and published by Capstone Software for the MS-DOS computer in 1993 on CD-ROM. This is your basic one-of-the-mill chess game with T2 artwork layered over the top with mini cutscenes seeing you attack as you defeat their pieces on the board. The cutscenes barely resemble the future war in the film. Is that Castle Grayskull in the background? So when choosing your sides, White is the human side with a T-800 as a king, Sarah Connor as a queen, two John Connors as bishops, two Miles Darsons as knights, and soldiers in green uniforms as rooks and pawns. Black is the machine side, grey coloured robots that don't look like the hunter killers, T-800 metal skeletons and the T-1000, etc. Computer Gaming World magazine reviewed it in March of 1994 alongside the new Star Wars chess game and compared the two licensed titles. The magazine reported that the Terminator game crashed so often, the graphics were unimpressive and transitioning between the board and battle sequences was painfully slow and the pieces were poorly animated. They felt the Star Wars game did a better job with the added bells and whistles, but this type of game is destined to collect dust on the shelf, they said. I for one can't stand chess games like this. You always saw these licensed chess titles back in the 90s, and no one I knew wanted to play them. It's like watching paint dry. Though I'm not a fan of the classic game, but it's certainly more fun playing that in real life instead of using a computer. When you look back to the early 90s and the various Terminator video games, the ones based on T2, the hottest movie of 1991 that kept getting talked about for years due to its state-of-the-art visual effects, so many Nintendo magazines use photos from the film to demonstrate the power of the upcoming N64 and its silicon graphics processor. What's funny is that it ended up with the majority of the games based on it ranging from average to downright rubbish. It seems these distributors were so hungry to cash in on the movie, the developers didn't get enough time or assets to really produce a solid game that people will still be talking about to this day. People still look fondly upon titles such as Super Star Wars Trilogy, The Addams Family and Batman Returns. Now of course the arcade game which got re-released by Arcade 1UP recently, which is clearly the standout title due to its slick graphics and sound, but the gameplay is a bit shallow and gets very repetitive. The ports at the time were pretty solid, but no one really talks about them anymore, and gamers of a particular age are far more nostalgic for the arcade. The Game Boy version not based on the coin-up is a hidden gem, and I do have a soft spot for the C64 game, which objectively isn't great. The platformer for the SNES and Mega Drive had potential to be a solid game. If you go back to the first film with the Terminator, the Mega CD version is still a lot of fun, and the Mega Drive game is fun for a quick playthrough. You could easily say the same about the T2 arcade version, but sadly I don't think there is a perfect game based on the film that sticks very close to the story and provides enough variety to stand the test of time, which is a real shame. And I think this added further to the narrative in the press that licensed games weren't very good. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos, then follow the link below.